Well, you can be seated if you can. You ought to feel like you've had a whole bath. Just been washed, just been cleansed. Hallelujah. God's got plans for you. God's got plans for me. God's got plans for us. Big plans. Hallelujah. I was wondering how I was going to minister this word this morning because we're going to go a little bit deep. But God gave you some anesthesia. Gave you some help for the hurt. Gave you a balm to soothe. Hallelujah. We started a series a couple of weeks ago. I'm going to still get y'all out on time. We started a series a couple of weeks ago called Defining Moments. And that series was birthed out of uh, the dealings of the Lord with my heart, letting us know that we as a body are in a defining moment. And we began our discussion two weeks ago kind of laying the foundation for what defining moments really are. And I kind of want to pick up today where we left off last week. Uh, so if you'll meet me in the book of Numbers chapter 20, Numbers chapter 20, verses 6 through 12. the fourth book in the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. No, not being funny. A lot of people have technology these days and don't know how to find it. Numbers 20, verses 6 through 12. I'm reading from the New Living Translation this morning. You may be reading from a different translation. Welcome to our social media audience. I pray that you could feel where you are, what we could feel in this place, and still feel the presence of the Lord is here. Numbers chapter 20, verses 6 through 12, it says, Moses and Aaron turned away from the people and went to the entrance of the tabernacle where they fell face down on the ground. Then the glorious presence of the Lord appeared to them. And the Lord said to Moses, you and Aaron must take the staff and assemble the entire community. As the people watch, speak to the rock over there and it will pour out its water. And you will provide enough water from the rock to satisfy the whole community and their livestock. So Moses did as he was told. And he took the staff from the place where it was kept before the Lord. And then he and Aaron summoned the people to come and to gather at the rock. But then Moses said, listen, you rebels, must we bring you water from this rock? And then Moses raised his hand and struck the rock twice with the staff and water gushed out. So the entire community and their livestock drank their fill. But the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, because you did not trust me enough, Because you did not trust me enough to demonstrate my holiness to the people of Israel, you will not lead them into the land that I'm giving them. 
I don't want that to be my testimony. Can you just tell somebody around close by, just say, don't get, don't settle in a place called stuck. Don't settle in a place called stuck. Father, we thank you for the move of your spirit. We thank you for your presence in this place. Now, Father, let this word be spirit. Let it be life. Let every ear hear. Let every heart receive. Because of it, let souls be saved. We thank you now. We give you glory. In Jesus' name, amen. I need to let you know why this series is necessary for this season of your life. If you're privileged to be here today, if you're privileged to have your family close by, your friends close by, just tell them God has plans for you. Oh yeah, he's got plans for you. And those plans are good. And I'm telling you, the plans are so good that they cannot be conceived within the recesses of your own mind. These plans are right up there with those plans that Paul was trying to articulate to the church at Corinth when he said, your eyes haven't seen it, your ears haven't heard it. Your heart cannot even conceive nor contain the things that God has in store for those who love him. Y'all remember he told Jeremiah, he said, I know the plans that I have for you. He didn't say, you know the plans. He said, I know the plans. You may not know what I've got up my sleeve, but, but I know the plans that I have for you. He said, I've got some plans to prosper you. I've got some plans, they're not to harm you, but I've got some plans to give you a hope in the midst of hopelessness all around you. I've got some plans to give you a future that you couldn't dream up on your best day. Can you just say it with me? Just some people who believe that God's got plans for me. The next time somebody calls you with something you know to be a distraction, if they ask you if you got plans, tell them I don't, but he does. God's got plans for me. So we're going to talk for a few minutes. I need you to know, uh, number one, the plan of God is the preference of God for your life. The plan of God is the preference of God for your life. God's plan is what he prefers for you. God's plan is what he sees for you. It's what he had in mind for you from before the foundation of the world. But in order for his preference to become your experience, it requires your participation. In order for his preference to become your experience, it requires your participation. God prefers for all of us that our lives end up in a certain place, that, that, that when he had us in mind, he aimed us at something. He pointed us towards something. And whether or not we reach that place is predicated or dependent upon our partnership. That God can want a thing for you, but God wanting a thing for you is not enough. That though God wants a thing for you and God is good, you got to want it for yourself. Can you just say, I want it? It doesn't matter what God sees if I don't see what I need to see. We're going to go a little bit deep. I said, it doesn't matter what God sees if I don't see what I need to see. And if I don't see what I need to see, I'll end up stuck in a place of bondage that I can't see that I'm in. So it's not enough just for God to see it. I've got to see it for me. And if I can't see what God wants me to see, I'll be stuck in a place of bondage 
saying that I'm free. Moses was a man for whom God had a plan. The plan of God was to use the life of Moses to lead Israel from Egypt to Canaan. God wanted to use him, meaning Moses, to lead them, Israel, from one place to another place. The assignment of Moses was to take the people to Canaan. The wilderness was not a part of that assignment. God didn't tell Moses anything about taking the people to the wilderness. He said, I want you to take them, lead them to Canaan. Canaan was God's preference for their life. So he said, Moses, your assignment is to take them from point A, Egypt, to point B, Canaan. That's the plan. But we briefly began to delve into it last week. Moses stopped short of his potential. So we pick up kind of mid conversation on this discussion that God is having with Moses in Numbers chapter 20. God looks on his people and he says, Moses, my people have a need. My people have a need, they need water. So Moses, I need you to meet the needs of the people. And he said, the way that I want you to meet the need of the people is I want you to speak to the rock. Yeah, he said, I I, I need you to speak to the rock, Moses, so that they will know where the water comes from. I don't want the water to come from a river because a river would be normal. A river would be natural. But what I I want you to do is I want you to speak to the rock because I want the water to come from an unexpected source. I, I want the water to come supernaturally. Because see, Moses, if the water comes from the river, they're going to think that the river is their source. But I want the water to come from an unexpected place so that when it comes from an unexpected place, they'll understand that the only reason that I have water is because I'm depending on the rock. The only reason why I have water is because God made a way where there was no way. That you got to understand God is not just in the results, but God is in the details. Oh, God said, Moses, I want you to speak in front of them so that they can see how I respond when my people are in need. God said, speak and let me show you what I can do. Oh, I can't tell you, but that's a good place to be when you're in a place that God is saying, let me show you what I can do. But Moses went out and, and he, he called the people in his frustration. He called the people a bunch of rebels. And Moses hit the rock, and just so you understand, it wasn't an accident. He hit the rock not one time, but two times, which lets us know there was intention there. And so God said, Moses, come here. You know you're in trouble when God says, come here. Um, God said, Moses, come here. Matter of fact, when you come, I want you to bring Aaron with you. You and your brother come here. And and so Moses and Aaron, they go up on the mountain and God said, look out right there. He said, you see Canaan? He said, you see it, but you'll never see it. Pastor, you told us this week, you told us this last week. I'm going to tell you in a way you can understand this week. Because see, sometimes God will give you a thing and he'll keep ministering that thing in your spirit and you'll be like, Lord, are we getting the full revelation of what it is that you are trying to show us, that you're trying to speak to us? He said, "You'll, you'll see it, but you will not experience it. And so it lets us know that sometimes just because we can see it in the realm of the spirit don't mean we will experience 
in the natural realm. Some of us, we, we can see things for our lives. We can see things for our families. We can see things for our church. We can see things for our businesses. We can see things for our careers. But just because you can see it, God says, don't mean you will experience it. Because whether or not you experience what you see is going to be based on seeing what you haven't seen. Moses saw Canaan. But he didn't get to experience it because there was something about himself that he didn't see. He, he couldn't see what he should see because he wouldn't see what he needed to see. So he was stuck in a place of bondage but didn't know he was stuck. He was trying to free people but he couldn't free himself. See, 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 if he would have been in a natural prison, uh, in a jail cell, he would have known that he was in prison. But when you're in prison in your mind, when you're in prison in your emotions, when you are in a prison within, you can be bound and not even know that you were bound. When I came to talk to some folk this morning who said, I refuse to settle in a place called stuck. I dare somebody to just say, Lord, show me what I need to see. Show me what I won't see. So I don't settle in a season called stuck. I want my mind unstuck. I want my house unstuck. I want my marriage unstuck. I want my children unstuck. I want my health unstuck. I want my peace unstuck. I want my joy unstuck. Help me to see what I need to see so I can see what I want to see. Moses stopped shy of where he could have ended up. He stopped shy of where he should have ended up. He stopped shy of the place that God preferred for him to end up, and it wasn't God's fault. Oh, y'all don't want to talk to me this morning. Y'all going, you're going, you going to say something? Come on now, don't, don't get quiet on me. Moses could not blame his stagnation on the will of God. Well, I'm going to help somebody who's not where you want to be and you keep saying you're not where you want to be because you're just waiting on the will of God. If Moses had said, well, I guess I'm, I'm where I am because this is just where God wanted me to be, he would be theologically inaccurate because that is a cop-out. But the thing that's scary is that we could all end up just like that. So we need the history and the life of Moses to help us learn what we need to learn so we don't end up like that. Why did Moses settle for a place called stuck? Why did Israel settle into a place of wandering and bondage for an extended period of time when God preferred for them to be free? Well, we need to hear from Moses on this because at this point, you nor I have the time nor the energy nor the resources to be wasting our time trying to fix the wrong problem. So let's consider something. Look with me, if you will, at verse six of Numbers chapter 20. It said, Moses and Aaron turned away from the people and went to the entrance of the tabernacle where they fell face down on the ground. 
Then the glorious presence of the Lord appeared to them. Okay, you got to watch this now because Moses fell short. Moses fell short, but it wasn't because he was lacking in worship. Moses fell short and it wasn't because the glory of the Lord had departed. We, we know that by verse 6. Because verse 6, Dr. Cersei said, they fell down on their face. They fell down on their face to the ground. Then the glorious presence of the Lord appeared to them. So now we understand that, that, that praise was not a problem. We, we know that worship was not their deficit. So they were, he was stuck, but neither worship, nor praise, nor the glory of God got him unstuck. <laughs> you cannot always praise your way out of stagnation. We want the glory. We need the glory. But Moses had it and was still stuck. In one instance, he went up to Mount Sinai and worshiped God. He was in the glory. He was so in the glory that when he came down, they had to veil his face because he was in the presence of God. He was in the presence of God praying regularly. He was in the presence of God worshiping God. He was in the manifest presence of God and he was still So what are you saying, Pastor? I'm saying that worship isn't the only key to unlock every bondage. Worship will help you handle yourself. Worship will help you handle the folk around you. Worship will usher you while you are in bondage but what's the what the enemy wants to do is to get us to a place where we are feeling free in church but bound again once we leave you can be in a place that you feel free but you are still bound because you're addressing the fruit but not the root and so because you address the leaves but not the root, you keep reaping the fruit of what has you bound. And so then we find ourselves in a place where we're waiting to go from one Sunday to the next Sunday and we come out of one bondage for a little while and then out of habit we return back to the bondage that had us bound before we started feeling better. So, so it wasn't for a lack of glory that Moses was still stuck in. It wasn't for a lack of worship that Moses was still stuck. And secondly, uh, it wasn't for a lack of the word that Moses was stuck. You remember uh, in one instance where he went up to Mount Sinai, uh, God gave Moses the Ten Commandments. Y'all remember that? Actually, God gave him more. It's just that uh, ten of them were engraved upon stone. 
So, so he had worship. We saw that in verse 6. He had the glory of the Lord. We saw that in verse 6. Uh, in verse 7, it said, and the Lord said to Moses. So God is speaking. There's instruction. There is a word. That God is giving Moses orders for his next steps, but Moses still fell short of his potential. Moses is showing up for the service. He's reading his Bible. He's taking notes from the messages. He's worshiping. He's experiencing the glory of God, but he is stuck. He, he's better, but he's still stuck. He moved from Egypt to the wilderness. But see, what, what I got to tell you this morning, y'all don't throw anything at me. What moved you from Egypt to the wilderness is not going to move you from the wilderness to the promised land. He had all the spiritual trappings, all of the equippings that you would think that one would need. But why did Moses stay stuck? Moses stayed stuck because he had an unaddressed, unidentified emotional issue. unaddressed, unidentified emotional issue that he assumed would be straightened out automatically by his spirituality. The reason that Moses missed Canaan wasn't because he was immoral. The reason that Moses missed Canaan is because though he was the sage of the age and the great leader, Moses missed it because he was emotionally immature. Follow the text. What was his problem? We see this unmanaged anger. His problem was not addiction. It was not immorality. It was emotional. And where he missed it was that he thought his calling was his healing. Can I tell you people of God, you might be called, but your calling is not your healing. to pursue your healing. Y'all remember last week we, we talked about it where he started with the killing of that Egyptian uh, where, where the Egyptian killed the Hebrew. And so Moses got all upset. And so he killed an Egyptian and hid the body. Y'all remember we talked about it last week? That, that, that before he had that encounter with the glory of God, before he came in and got salvation. I'm just. Before he had that encounter at the burning bush. He had some stuff. And so then he has this encounter with the burning bush. And, and he, Moses had the encounter with the burning bush. Moses had these encounters on the mountain. Moses had the kind of encounters that had him glowing on the outside. And so because he was glowing on the outside, he thought that everything was fixed on the inside. And so he, he comes down and God is using him and, and he stretches out that rod and, and, and the Red Sea is parted and, and he throws his stick in the water and, and the bitter waters are turned into sweet waters and, and, and God is using him in this amazing way. And the Bible said that, that after all of these things happen, Moses is thinking he's over that thing. 
And when he thinks he is delivered in all actuality, it's just dormant. Oh, y'all just missed something right there. Don't confuse dormant with delivered. Let me say it again, that just because something lays dormant in your life does not mean you are delivered. You don't know that you're delivered until you are faced with the same opportunity to respond the same way, but you respond differently. That's how you know you're delivered. Being delivered don't mean you're never faced with the same thing. It means you get faced with it again and again, but you learn how to respond differently. Tell somebody, don't confuse dormant with delivered. See, your calling is not your healing. And and just because you are called don't mean that you were healed. And so God is using Moses in unprecedented ways. God was using Moses in such a way that even his siblings got a little cray-cray. Miriam and Aaron start talking about him. I don't know why he thinks he's the only one God can talk to. God can talk to me just like God can talk to him. And and see, here's the thing. I went back and I looked. Moses did not even hear that. God shielded him. Moses didn't hear it, but God did. And so God begins to to show up on Moses' behalf and God begins to brag on Moses. That's how much God thought about Moses, but he still had an issue that kept him in a place of bondage and he didn't know he was bound. And because he didn't know it, uh, he, he could not see it. Moses was in a place of God is using me, I must be over it. If, if it hasn't come to the surface in a long time, I must be delivered. But look at the text. When God calls Moses up to the mountain, he does not call Moses alone. He said, come here, bring Aaron with you. And it's right there in verse eight. He said, you and Aaron must take the staff and assemble the entire community. As the people watch you, I want you to speak to the rock over there and it's going to pour out its water. It's not going to be a little bit of water. It's going to be enough water for the whole community and their livestock. I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to take care of the whole community. If you'll just do what I tell you to do, I'm even going to take care of the animals. Nothing has to go lacking. God sent Aaron to compliment Moses. That that Moses was so unsure of himself. God said, I'm going to show you how to depend on me, but I'm going to make sure you have what you need while you're being trained in righteousness. But now Moses has decided to settle in in a season called stuck. Which means that those who were assigned to help Moses are also in a season called stuck. Because you don't need nobody to help you if you ain't doing nothing. So, so he, here's one of the quandaries of leadership. Because if you don't do what God tells you to do, everybody connected to you is affected and impacted by the decisions that you make. See, if I'm a parent and I have a child, if as a parent I decide to be stuck, that may mean my children are stuck too because I decided to be stuck and stuck is the only frame of reference they have. Procrastination is the only frame of reference they have. Moses did not have a problem with morality. Moses had a problem with brokenness. Brokenness. 
And brokenness is not something you outgrow. I'm going to say that again for the people in the back. Moses, I'm sorry. Brokenness is not something that you outgrow. No matter how much you grow spiritually, you do not outgrow brokenness. Brokenness is not fixed by time, but broken is fixed by intention. L. R. Nost says, do not be dismayed by the brokenness of the world. All things break and all things can be mended. Not by time, as they say, but with intention. So go, love intentionally. Love extravagantly, love unconditionally because the broken world awaits in darkness for the light that is in you. You do not outgrow brokenness. But when you are broken, you've got to give attention to the issue. Moses stopped short of his potential, not for lack of glory, not for lack of praise and worship, not for a lack of the word, not for a lack of giftedness. But he stopped shy of his potential because he could not see that there was something unseen that was holding him in bondage. Moses was dealing with unmet needs. His anger was his pain talking. His, his anger was his main method of managing pain. May, may, you know, I'm just going to speculate a little bit right here. But, but maybe since Moses was a man, Maybe because of the culture of that day, he had been taught that it was not all right to cry. Though he was abandoned unintentionally, abandoned by force, but for a child, all that a child knows is I didn't grow up without my mother. I, I grew up without my mother. All the child knows is I didn't get to grow up knowing my father. Y'all remember his mother nursed him, but she didn't get to raise him. She nursed him, which means that when he came off of milk, he was no longer in her care. And so here he is, a Hebrew who was raised by Egyptians in an Egyptian home, but he didn't feel like he fit anywhere. How do we know? Well, because if he were Egyptian, if he identified as Egyptian, more than likely because of the culture that they were in, if he saw a Hebrew being beaten because of the culture of that day, if he was Egyptian and identified as Egyptian, he wouldn't have cared. But he felt anger because he identified with the Hebrews as his people. So he feels rejected by his mother. She had to push him out in order to save his life. But as a child, there's no way he could have understood that. So all he knows is my mama put me in a basket on the river I don't fit in in the house where I'm being raised. Then he kills the Egyptian. The Bible said he looked around and saw no one. Look at Exodus chapter two, verse 12. After looking in all directions to make sure no one was watching. 
Moses killed the Egyptian and hid his body in the sand. So Moses is in a place where he's saying, nobody sees my issues. No, nobody knows that, that I've got something going on. And the next day, Moses sees two Hebrews fighting. Look at Exodus chapter two, verse 13 and 14. It said the next day when Moses went out to visit his people again, he saw two Hebrew men fighting. Now, now Moses is gonna be the great intercessor. Why are you beating up your friend? Moses says this to the person who started the fight. The man replied, who appointed you our prince and our judge. I know what you did last night. He said, <laughs> the man said, who appointed you, our prince and our judge? Now, wait a minute. Moses is risking his life for the people he is called to help. And they asking him, why are you in our business? Rejection again. Because he's like, wait a minute, y'all live over there. I live over here. You in bondage, I'm free. And so there's this exchange between them. And Moses is like, I'm trying to help you. Now I'm being rejected and I'm trying to help. Rejected by his mother. Rejected by the people he grew up with. Now rejected by the people he's called to help. Rejected by people he don't necessarily need. And the man says, who appointed you to be our judge and our prince? Are, are you going to kill me like you killed the Egyptian yesterday? Oh, suck you now. Ain't this just how we work? Oh, we finna talk about it. You, you, you gonna do to us what you did to the Egyptian? See, see, here's where we learn something right here. Because this, this, this was scary for Moses because most of the time, people can see about you what you can't see about yourself. But the only time they're going to say something about it is when you make them mad enough to say it. And when they unload on you, you ugly, your teeth crooked, your mama dresses you funny, and your breath is bad. I didn't like you then, and I don't like you. And they just start unloading, and now you're hurt like you've never been hurt before because you're saying, I've been sitting up here thinking you love me, and you didn't like me no way. Look at Exodus 2.15, and sure enough, Pharaoh heard what had happened. And he tried to kill Moses, but Moses fled from Pharaoh and went to live in the land of me. Wait a minute. Mama rejected you. The people you grew up with rejected you. The people you're called to help are rejecting you. And now the man who raised you as your father is rejecting you. Rejection over and over and over again. See, everybody needs acceptance. And though Moses was great, he still needed acceptance. And when that need is not met, that unmet need produces pain. And if that pain is not properly processed, and if, if it is not checked by those who are around him, see, real friends give you more than company. Real friends will give you truth. And sometimes it may be truth that you don't want to hear, but the Bible said faithful are the wounds of a friend. So he's dealing with rejection. But see, if we don't understand what is beneath the symptoms, then we will deal with that anger when the issue is really hurt. 
Y'all getting a whole counseling session up in here today. And see, if we don't deal with the hurt, we will, settle, we will settle for stuck and call it success. Moses had been engaging in self-sabotaging behavior long before the rock incident. You can look at the life of Moses and you can see your own life. You can begin to see some things that may be holding you in a place of bondage and before now you haven't even seen it. Y'all still there? You okay? Is this helping anybody? Let me ask you a question. Are you admiring something about someone that is actually the fruit of their dysfunction? Because sometimes, you know, you see people who are, who are out in the, in the limelight, out in the spotlight, you know, they're, they're the top 20 speakers in the world, and, they're the, the, and you're looking and you're saying, oh, but they're so driven. The question is, what is driving your drivenness? Because sometimes we find ourselves in a place we are trying to emulate the activity of something that in reality is the evidence of an unmet need. And that, my friends, is dysfunction. T uh, hashtag team no sleep. Hashtag no days off. Hashtag, I'm about to get it. And what you're looking at and admiring could be overcommitment. I used to think it was admirable to go for weeks off of two and three hours of sleep a night. I would have people send me text messages, do you ever sleep? And it made me feel good about myself. You been there? You think I'm killing it. No, you're killing you. Overcommit. There is a difference between being dedicated to something and being overcommitted to too many things. Uh, we gonna have some quarantine chronicles up in here today. <laughs> Over committed means you commit yourself beyond what is feasible or necessary. It's a commitment to others at a detriment to yourself. And most people trying to figure out why am I overcommitting, you got to understand there is a much deeper root to your, your proclivity to overcommit. That, that, that when you overcommit, you overfunction. And when you overfunction, you wind up in a place where you end up doing for other people what other people should be doing for themselves. And then when you overfunction, your overfunctioning breeds resentment. That's what happened with Mary and Martha. I'm almost through. I know you're looking. It's 1115. But, but, but it happened with Mary and Martha. When Jesus came, here Mary is sitting at the feet of Jesus. Jesus is in my house. If you think I'm fixing to miss a moment with Jesus, you have lost your mind. But then you got Mary who is trying to clean the baseboards, trying to dust the countertops, trying to get the food off the counter, trying to, and she gets mad at Mary and Jesus because everybody is not functioning the way that she is functioning so you got to understand over functioning breeds resentment because you can never expect a functional response out of dysfunctional people because if they were functional you wouldn't have to overcommit in the first place am I helping anybody so let me talk to hashtag team too much See, see, we do too much. Because
because somewhere we did not feel like we had the help that we needed. And so because we don't want anybody to ever have to experience what we experienced, we run around trying to be everything to everybody all the time, trying to prevent them from experiencing what we've already been through and you cannot do it. Every need is not your obligation. I'm going to say it again. Every need is not your obligation. I'm going to say it again. Every need is not your obligation. And when you feel that every need is your obligation, you place yourself in the position of being God and you're not him. God is the only one who is responsible enough and has the resources to be able to meet every one of your needs. There are some needs that are not your obligation. And you cannot allow everyone's dysfunction to become your responsibility. Henry Cloud says they can be irresponsible and happy while you are responsible and miserable. Anybody ever been there? I thank God for five folk who ain't gonna leave me out here by myself. Because if you're a caretaker by nature, and most of us as females are, you are taking responsibility for everybody else's irresponsibility. And you don't realize your problem is not over committing. There's, there's something deeper going on. And you're not going to stop over committing until you deal with the root. Moses is helping me. Is there anybody in here who can say Moses is helping me right now? Moses, Moses is helping me because Moses was overcommitted. But his overcommitment came from the root of rejection and abandonment. Moses was, number two, unclear on his assignment. Some people who are doing everything they can are unclear on the something they should do because they're so busy doing the many things they can do. When you're clear on something, you will no longer have the need for everything. That's why Jethro was so important. He said, Moses, he said, son, what you're, what you're doing is not good. And when you learn to do what you need to do, when you learn what you need to say yes to, when you learn what you need to say no to, don't let your yes to the wrong thing have you saying no to the right thing. It's almost over. Some people would look at Moses and they would say, oh, he's so considerate, he's so kind, he's so accommodating. But God saw it different. And God said, Moses, um, I'm going to take some people out of your life. And I'm going to send you some people who are going to serve with you. They're going to work alongside you. And, and Moses said, no, no, Lord, don't do it. I, I love them. Okay. Moses couldn't see what he needed to see because he undervalued himself. Can you put a note to self in your phone? Can you do that for me? This is a note to you from you. And I want your note to say, stop undervaluing you. Stop undervaluing you. Moses failed to reach the place of his destination because he did not place value where God placed value. 
And a lot of us who get to a place in life where we're just jacked up, we get jacked up because we're placing value on the wrong things. We're, we're placing value on the wrong areas of our life, which means when you're placing the wrong value on the wrong areas, the, the place that need that are lacking that. If you allow people to surround you who do not value you, it means you have failed to properly assess who you are. Which means you should never be discouraged when you lose a liability. You should only be discouraged if you lose an asset. Moses put up with and tolerated what he shouldn't have because he did not properly assess his own value in God's eyes. Moses said, Lord, if they leave me, I won't have anybody. My mother rejected me, the Egyptians rejected me, the Hebrews rejected me, the man who raised me rejected me. The people are all I have left. But what Moses didn't realize is that so many of the people connected to him were only connected to him for what they could get from him. He misunderstood the nature of their relationship. He thought they really loved him. That, that, that's why I try to be real careful with my staff and tell them, I appreciate your gift, but I want you to know I love you. Because I've seen so many people who were only embraced for what they could bring or for what they can give. And I don't want that to be the case with the people here. I want you to know that at the end of the day, if you can't play any more songs, if you can't sing nothing else, if you can't dance, twirl, flip, or turn a knob, I love you for you. I don't love you because you stand up on the cameras on Sunday morning. I love you for you. I appreciate what you do. We all value what you do. What you do adds value to what we do. But I love you not for your gift. I love you for you. But the folk in this text valued Moses for what he could do for them. And he loved them so much, Moses truly loved them. But Moses loved them so much that when God tried to protect him from people who would ultimately stop him, he interceded before God on their behalf. Ultimately, God knew these people are going to frustrate you to the degree that they will trigger your weakness. We might be talking about people at your house. We might be talking about people on your job. We might be talking about people from your past, people from your present, or we might be helping you out for some people coming in the future. And so... God had great plans for Moses. Actually, God had great plans for them too, but together they weren't good. And so God said, I'm going to try to separate you from the people who trigger your weaknesses. So, so Moses, you're going to have to suffer for a season and be in a season without company. And so, y'all still breathing. <laughs> And, and so, so Moses was like, Lord, I don't want to be by myself for a season. And God was like, the pain of being by yourself for a season will not even compare to the pain that you will experience if you stop short of your potential. So God said, I'd rather you be lonely for a season than stuck for the rest of your life. Because I got plans for you. 
And see, these things in and of themselves don't appear to be so bad. You know, I'm, I'm a little overcommitted. Well, that's not such a bad thing. You know, I'd rather wear out than rust out. Uh, I, I, I would rather undervalue myself. I'd rather undervalue myself than be arrogant and full of pride. It's no big deal. Oh, they're equal. Oh, I'm just a little foggy on my assignment. And see, all of these things, they're seemingly harmless. But, 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 but when you don't see them for what they are, when you don't understand the collective power, you're going to find yourself one day where you're going to be striking what you st should be speaking to. If you don't handle it, you're going to strike at what you should speak to. And it'll cost you everything. For, for Moses, it was his anger. For Moses, it was that, that root of rejection. For some people, it's low self-esteem. For some people, it's drivenness. For some people, it's ambition. And, and see, I'm not here to judge Moses. And you shouldn't either, because we all got some strange fruit that comes from a very deep root. But today, today is the day that somebody is going to make a decision. Today is the day that somebody's going to say, I refuse to settle in a place called stuck. Today is the day that somebody is going to embrace God's plan for your life. Today is the day that you're going to break out. And anybody that ever truly breaks out, don't break out because you broke yourself out. You break out because somebody shows up to help break you out. And I want to let you know there's somebody in the house today that is here to help break you out. Luke 4, 18 said, the Lord is here for the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. The Spirit of the Lord has anointed me today to bring good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim that the captive shall be released. He sent me today to say that the blind will see. He sent me today to say that today is the day that the oppressed shall go free. This is the time that the favor of the Lord has been poured out upon this place and upon this people. That Jesus has come to break you out of your bondage. To free you from the things that you can't see. To come and set you free from the things you didn't even know you needed to be free from. And today, I want to pray for those who are willing to see what you need to see. I pray that the Lord would open your eyes. I pray that the scales would begin to fall. I pray that vision would be restored, that you would see clearly. Not just what you want to see, but what you need to see. I pray for every person in this place today who has been bound to overcommitment and to overfunctioning because you didn't know how to deal with or uproot that root of rejection, that fear of abandonment, that fear of loneliness. I pray today for every person in this place who has undervalued yourself. For every person who has failed to assign worth to the same places that God assigns worth and value in your life. I pray today for every person who is unclear concerning your assignment. I pray that God would give you to the, the grace to say yes when you need to say yes. That God would give you the grace to say no when you need to say no. That God would give you grace to speak to what you need to speak to. That you would not disqualify yourself for striking at what you need to speak to. 
in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, everybody said amen, amen and amen. Now, if you're in this place today and you say, Pastor, I need a savior. I need to be forgiven for my sins. I know that I've sinned. I know that I have fallen short of the glory of God. But today I want to surrender my heart. Today I want to surrender my life. Maybe you're backslidden and you say today I want to recommit. I've committed to everything else, but I've not committed to the one who committed to me. If that's you today, I want to give you the opportunity to renew your commitment, to receive salvation, to know that you are right with God. And whether you be here in this building or whether you be watching by way of our social media platforms, if that's you, I just want you to lift up your hand. I just want you to place a comment in the feed and say, I need Jesus. I can't do this by myself. I cannot conquer this in my own strength. I need a savior. I want to be forgiven. I want to be cleansed from all unrighteousness. I want to know him and I want him to know me. If that's you, I want you to raise your hands and I'm going to pray with you right where you are. Hallelujah. God sees those hands. God sees those hands. For those of you who are commenting on our social media platforms, we see you. We hear you. And I want to let you know you're not hidden. God knows right where you are. And he responds to you just like he responds to us. I'm going to ask everybody in the building, if you would, to stand to your feet and pray this prayer with me. Say, Heavenly Father, I come to you now. I confess that I've sinned and fallen short of your glory. I thank you for loving me enough to look beyond my faults and discern my needs. I ask you now to cleanse me, forgive me, heal me, come into my heart, be my savior, be my Lord. Fill me with your spirit. Make the rough places smooth. Make the crooked places straight. And deliver me. In Jesus' name I pray. Hallelujah. Now I confess with my mouth what I believe in my heart that because of the blood of Jesus I am saved hallelujah if you prayed that prayer you got a reason to rejoice can we give God glory all over this place today can we give God glory all over the house today for those who were saved for those who recommitted for those who came in repentance for overcommitting, for overfunctioning, for ultimately not trusting God, for not trusting God to prove himself, for not allowing God to reveal himself. Father, we all repent and we say, oh, for grace to trust you more. Perhaps there's somebody now who said, I need a church home, I need a pastor, I need a place of worship, I need a covering. If you're watching by way of Facebook, if you're on YouTube, if you're here in our service and you want a church home and you've been praying and God has said, this is the place, this is your opportunity for God to graft you in, this is your opportunity to be adopted as a son, adopted as a daughter, this is your opportunity to have a family to grow with, to learn with, to be discipled with. And if that's you, I want you to just raise your hand and we're going to pray and receive you in. I see that hand. If there's anybody else, hallelujah. I'm going to ask those of you, if you'll comment, raise your hand. Say, I want to be a member of the Jackson Revival Center church family. We're going to pray with you as we pray with these here. Heavenly Father, we thank you for those who have come to be a part of our local church body. We thank you for those who want to be a part of our family. And Father, we thank you for so graciously adding. We pray that this would be one of the best decisions that they've ever made. 
that they'll be blessed in their coming in, blessed in their going out, when they're at work, when they're at rest. Father, we pray that you would crown their efforts with great success, that you would bless the works of their mind, bless the works of their hands, and use them mightily throughout the earth. We pray that this would be one of the best decisions that they've ever made, that they would be faithful in their attendance, faithful to give of their tithe and offering, faithful to give of the gifts and the talents that you've placed on the inside of them. Now, Father, it is our covenant with them and our covenant with you that we will love them, we will embrace them, we will receive them as members of our family. Father, we will study to show ourselves approved that we might rightly divide the word of truth, that they may receive that word and grow thereby. We'll pray for them, we'll marry their young, we'll bury their old, together we will do life. Now, Father, we will occupy until you come. We give you praise. We give you glory. We give you honor. And we call it also, not by the works of our hands, but Father, by the moving of your spirit. We give you glory now. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen, amen, and amen. Can you just lift up your hands and give God glory all over this place? Hallelujah. Did anybody receive anything today? Hallelujah. I believe that some things have been uprooted this morning that needed to be uprooted. I'm believing that God is bringing us as a body from brokenness to wholeness. That we're not going to just be a shouting people, but we're going to be a whole people. We're not going to just be a shouting people, broken and fragmented, but we're going to be a shouting people because we've allowed God to do the work that needed to be done because we operate in an atmosphere of sonship. An atmosphere of truth, an atmosphere of love, an atmosphere of peace, long-suffering, forgiveness. Hallelujah. And as long as we do, there will always be healing in this house. Hallelujah.